we talked, we ended last time talking about the hip. Um, so we'll move up to the upper extremity and talk about one of the two hinge joints. So the elbow and the knee are the, the principal hinge joints in the body. And remember, a hinge is a joint that really only moves in one direction. So the elbow, the hinge part, is where the ulna comes together with the humerus. So we call that the humero ulnar. So humerus or humero for humerus and ulnar. The humero ulnar joint is that hinge joint. It's very strong. Um, it has very little uh, mobility except in its one direction, um, and that's because the um, the uh, U of the ulna literally fits around the uh, the trochlea of the humerus, which you'll get to see in lab next week when we have the humeruses uh, or humeri and um, ulnas on the table so you can put them together. Um, so that's one part of the elbow joint, because the truth is the elbow joint is really three joints in one, because we have three different bones involved. We have the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. So each one of these gets its own joint, so to speak. Um, so that's the humeral ulnar joint, the hinge. The humeral radial joint um, is unique in the body uh, because it's a joint that allows a rotation alone. So the radius rotates, and that's how we pronate and supinate. And I have a video of that here in a minute that will let you see what I mean by that. So the, uh, the humeral radial uh, joint is um, circular. Um, it looks a little bit like, the, you know, the head of the radius looks a little bit like a golf tee. And surrounding that head of the golf tee is a ligament that's round. It's called the angular ligament. And then the radial ulnar joint, where the radius attaches to the ulna, um, is not a, a very important or um, a particularly interesting joint. It, it just simply holds the radius and ulna together so that they can't separate from each other. Because if the radius and ulna could pull apart, well, then the, the uh the, the elbow joint would basically come apart because the bones would no longer be in alignment. So um, here's kind of the, the ligaments that make those three joints possible. So one of those is here. Here's the annular ligament. You can see it better on this side. And you can see how it's sort of circular. So it comes up um, and around and uh, then onto the other side. So the annular ligament holds the head of the radius and attaches it to the humerus. And it allows that radius to spin inside it. Because it's circular, and because the head of the radius is also circular, there's a spinning motion that can take place there. All right. And then the other two that you should know um, are the ulnar collateral ligaments and the um, radial collateral ligaments. A collateral ligament is just a ligament on the side. That's what that word means. So, and we're going to see in the knee that there are collateral ligaments there too. So the collateral ligaments hold the joints or hold the bones together from the side, which allows the bones to still move, but it firmly connects the one bone to the next so that they can't come apart very easily. So the one on the radial side, we just call the radial collateral ligament. And then the one on the ulnar side, um, which is right here, we call the ulnar collateral ligament. All right. So that radiohumeral joint is a little hard to visualize, so we have a movie here. All right, so this is a cadaver elbow. So just to orient you, this is the humerus here. Here's the radius. You can see it's kind of round head. Here's the ulna, and here's the trochlea of the humerus here that the ulna fits into. Now what I want you to watch is I want you to watch this bone right here, the radius. Because as we pronate and supinate, you'll see that that radial head will spin. Okay, so that's, that's flexion at the elbow. So that's the ulna moving with respect to the um, ulna and humerus. And then here comes the radial motion. Do you see that? Whoa. So it's a unique, <laughs> it's a unique <laughs> joint in the body because of how it spins. You know, normally things in the body can't spin because there's veins and arteries and nerves, right, that would keep it from turning. Well, the radius evolved to be able to turn like that. So, like, it gets its blood supply from the other end, 
so that that radius can spin in that um, annular ligament. So here, I'm just, we're not going to watch the whole thing again, but. So here's that annular ligament that wraps around trochlea of the um, humerus, the ulna, and then at the end there, there's that rotational motion. So that's pronation and supination. So when you are in lab next week, go to one of the skeletons and turn his hand up and then turn his hand down and you'll see how that motion happens. That as that radius spins, the thumb comes up and around so that the palms face forward. All right. Okay, so that's the, the elbow. The elbow is fairly commonly injured, um, not because it, there's anything wrong with it or because it's not strong, but the bottom line is, you know, we have a tendency to put our hands out when we're falling. Um, so the elbow can endure a lot of forces sometimes. So you'll get uh, uh, fractures there. And also, it's relatively exposed. Not as exposed as the knee, but the, you know, the arms can be out there in the environment, so to speak, and can take a hit. All right. So then we get down into the knee. By far, the strongest joint, uh, or the strongest of the hinge joints. Um, you can make a case that it's one of the stronger joints in the body, but the hip and the knee are both very strong, so it's hard to tell you know, which is stronger. Um, the knee has a big job. It has to carry you know, about 80% of the body's weight um, from the top down into the tibia and into the feet. So it's, it's a weight-bearing joint. So it takes a lot of, of wear and tear. You know, as we walk, however much you weigh, you know, 80% of that is going through that joint all the time. Um, so it has to be robust and it has to be strong. So the knee has uh, many different stabilizations to keep it um, locked in place so that it can't um, uh, bend laterally you know, to one side or the other, but that instead the forces just go straight down. <coughs> The knee, you know, we've all heard about in sports and stuff that knees get injured. They don't get injured because there's anything evolutionarily wrong with them. They get injured because they carry a lot of, of weight and they're quite exposed. You know, to injure the arm, you have to get through the body, so to speak, because usually the arms are relatively co close to the body. But the knee is out there all by itself in the middle of the leg. So, it gets injured, particularly in sports, because it's exposed. Um, you know, somebody falls or, or, uh, or uh, uh, runs into someone, and where are they likely to hit? Down low and in the middle, which is right where the knee is. <clears throat> so the knee's anatomy is relatively complicated, but just to orient, you know, the, the patella is here on the top, and it lives inside the quadriceps tendon. So the quadriceps are the big muscles on the anterior part of the thigh. They extend the leg, um, so they uh, extend the knee. And that ligament goes from the quadriceps, which is up here, and attaches here to the tibial tuberosity of the tibia. And then inside that ligament forms the patella. So once we have a patella, we call the uh, connection between the patella and the tibia the patellar ligament. All right. On both sides of the knee, we have collateral ligaments. These are stabilizing ligaments. They keep the, the tibia from sliding to the left or sliding laterally or sliding medially in the joint. So they keep it sort of locked in place. But because they're on the side, the, the knee can still flex um, because these ligaments are not preventing motion. They're just keeping the bones from separating. Now. There has been a change in naming of these collateral ligaments. Um, so currently, the, the proper anatomic name is there's a tibial collateral ligament on the tibial side, and there's a fibular collateral ligament on the fibula side. Now, no one uses these terms, at least not yet. What you're instead going to hear are what I wrote up on the board. The tibial collateral ligament is called the medial collateral ligament, and that's because it's on the medial side, it's on the inside of the leg. And the fibular collateral ligament is called the lateral collateral ligament, otherwise known as MCL and LCL. So we have the medial and lateral um, uh, collateral ligaments. Um, and then in the, uh, uh, at the back of the knee, we have the popliteal. The popliteal fossa is the 
back part of the knee. Um, so we just call these the popliteal, poplit, popliteus is knee in uh, Greek. So we have the popliteal ligaments, um, tibia, fibula, all right. <clears throat> so if we look, if we strip away some of that um, uh, external stuff, we can see some of the other uh, anatomy of the knee. Okay, so this is the knee flex. So it's like this. So when, and we're looking at it straight on. So this is the surface of the femur where you'll see the lateral and medial condyles. So um, these are the smooth parts that the tibia slides on. So the patella has been removed here. And what you're looking at is the, the knee joint from the front, but with the knee flexed. So you're looking into the, the top of the femur. Uh, so lateral and medial condyles. Here's that fibular collateral ligament, usually called the lateral collateral. Here's the tibial collateral on the side, um, also called the MCL. And then inside the knee joint itself, we have two ligaments that cross each other. You know, you can see how one comes this way and one comes this way. And here in the back, you can see that there's sort of a cross there. Those are the cruciate ligaments. Cruciate means cross. So there's an anterior cruciate ligament and a posterior cruciate ligament. So there's two of them. So those are the ACL and PCL. And you might, these words might sound familiar because these are very commonly injured ligaments, particularly in athletes. Um, so you'll hear about ACL injuries or PCL injuries. And what they're talking about are these ligaments that are found deep inside the knee joint that help to keep the femur and tibia joined together. Um, they, they literally hold the two bones together like strings, but it also allows the tibia to slide across that surface of the femur. So inside, in between the lateral and medial condyles, there's this cross of ligaments, and that's the ACL and PCL. All right. So the top of the tibia is relatively flat, so that's right here. But the condyles of the femur are rounded. So we need a way to turn rounded into flat. And the, the, what we have for that are the menisci. So a meniscus is just a lens. You might have heard that word in um, early science classes. You know, when you, when you put water in a graduated cylinder, it doesn't have a flat line, right? It has a little curve to it, and we call that a meniscus. Well, the menisci in the knee have that same shape. They're sort of like a cup. Um, so if you were to, to look at them in, oh, that's great. If you were to look at them in cross-section, each menisci looks a little bit like, like this. So they have this kind of cup to it. And the condyles of the femur sit in one in each cup. And then the flat part of the tibia then comes along like this. So we can effectively turn the rounded condyles into a, a, a flat spot for the tibia. Because the tibia, remember, looks like a giant golf tee. So um, the medial and lateral menisci are uh, cartilage. They're sort of rubbery in character that have this rounded shape, this cup-like shape. And basically, they keep the uh, femur and tibia lined up right so that as the uh, femur uh, or as the tibia uh, moves along the condyles, it, it stays in position. Yes? So when an ACL is torn, repair any repair itself? Repair itself? It would depend on if it's totally torn or not. I mean, if it's completely transected, like there's no connection, it might not ever heal because it doesn't know where to heal to. But if it's a partial tear, it would heal eventually. But one of the reasons they have to go in and fix these is if it's a complete tear, you now have this ligament that's just kind of loose in the joint. And it's not doing its job anymore. So they go in with a, a camera and they'll reattach it where it's supposed to be. All right. Um, so the, the femur and the tibia, the only places they meet are at the condyles. And in between, in that space between the condyles and the tibia, that's where we have our menisci. Um, so 
important uh, anatomy to know, I added this up here, which is not in the printed out version. So you should know the ACL and PCL, so the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, um, the TCL, which is also the MCL, so the tibial collateral is usually called the medial collateral. Um, the FCL, the fibular collateral, is also called the lateral collateral. Sorry for the confusion, but you know the anatomists try to change the names to have things make more sense, but there's all these medical professionals that learn the, a different name. So what do they use? They use the name they learn. So sometimes you have to learn both. And then uh, the menisci, <coughs> um, uh, medial and lateral menis uh, menisci, and then the condyles, the medial and lateral condyles, which are really part of the femur. All right. So let's look at the knee in action. Oops, hold on. We got a light show going on here. There we go. All right. The knee. Here's the medial collateral ligament. What's the movement and flexion extension? So this of the medial collateral. That's ligament. the medial collateral ligament. Femur, tibia, patella. So you can see that that MCL, it holds the bones together, but it doesn't restrict the, the proper motion of the knee, which is that flexion of the tibia on the uh, <coughs> um, femur. Do they just okay. not show the ligament going from the top of the patella to the femur? Correct, okay. because that's actually a tendon, okay. because it connects uh, muscle to bone. Here's the lateral collateral ligament. So now we're on the other side. Here's the fibula, right? So this is the, the ligament we're looking at, the lateral collateral ligament or the fibular collateral ligament. And you can see that the movement of the, of the uh, femur on the tibia and also look at the ligament being moving forward and back. And look at the whole movement of the whole joint here. You can also watch the patella and the patellar tendon. We'll just do that one again. Here's the Maybe patella. the patella and the patellar tendon. See how the patella slides in place? And it does, by doing so, it protects the articular cartilage of the femur. Otherwise, that articular cartilage, which is very important, it has to be smooth, right, or you have knee problems, it's always shielded by, a, by bone, even when the knee is totally flexed. Sliding in that fashion. See how the patella slides in the groove there, in their condylar space, in their condylar groove. Here we have the patellar motion from above. So looking down. Flexion extension. And you can see it slides in on that groove. Normally it should stay right in its intercommonal space. Um, these are the primal pictures um, slides. Here we have what's called patellofemoral tracking. This is the tracking that should take place where that patella stays right in that groove in the intercommonal space. Here we see again patellar ligament, and we see the, the course of it tracking. So it stays again. right in place. And it should slide evenly and, and uh, smoothly through that groove. And when sometimes there's an imbalance in the muscle, particularly the quadriceps vastus muscles, for the most part, it could be other muscles, but the vastus muscles, it will not slide in that groove and create a lot of pain as the patient flexes and extends their knee. Here's more tibial femoral motion. And you see the posterior collateral ligament and the anterior collateral ligament, posterior collateral ligament. Okay, so now the, the patella has been removed. So we're seeing the femur moving on the tibia the anterior here. Anterior collateral ligament. I'm sorry, posterior anterior collateral. And here, sorry, I keep interrupting the guy, but um, here, here are those cruciate ligaments right here inside. We need to know which is which. The, it, they're named according to where they originate. So the, this would be the anterior cruciate because it comes from the front. And the posterior cruciate comes from the back. But no, I won't ask you to discriminate between the two. And things. here we see another one. These are so cool, I just thought I'd put them all in. You can see the collateral ligaments. And here's the lateral collateral ligament and the, the uh, cruciate ligaments. I mean, I said collateral, my cruciate ligaments. All right, let me look at this one again. So the cruciate ligaments, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. The medial collateral ligament, the lateral collateral ligament, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments firing. Okay. So with those in mind, then the right. patella. So that's the knee in motion. Kind of cool, I think. 
Um, it, you know, the knee, the bones there are so big. You know, you, you have the femur, which is the largest bone, and the, um, the uh, condylar and where the condyles are is the larger part of the bone. And then you have the tibia, which has this large flat spot. So this is a big joint. You know, it's the biggest joint in the body, short of maybe the vertebral column, if you call it that. So, you know, you've got a, a surface area like this on the end of the femur. So um, there's a lot going on in the knee. All right, let's do some questions here. And activity. So, which of the following movements does not occur at the knee joint? It's coming. There we Remember, this is a does not, does not occur. <laughs> All right. So flexion and extension, those are the primary motions at the knee, right? You know, the, the tibia flexes on the femur and extends on the femur. Abduction. That would be the, the tibia and femur coming apart like this. So the normal knee does not do that. So um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, so C would be the best answer. So what about B? Rotation. There is the tibia does rotate on the femur. Um, you know, so you know if your knees are bent and you go to a fully extended position, you know we call it locking our knees or locking our legs. That actually happens because the tibia rotates slightly against the femur, and it allows us to stand without having to constantly be um, flexing our quadricep muscles. So uh, the tibia does rotate on the femur. It's part of locking the legs into position, you know, which they tell you not to do if you're standing for long periods of time. And the reason for that is when you when you get tired and you go down, there's your legs don't help you to break your fall because your legs are locked, so you just go plunk. If any of you have ever been in like marching band or anything like that. All right. The thick fibrocartilage discs found in the knee joint are called which of those things? I like that word sheath. I like that word. And next week in lab, I'll have the uh, the joints models out for you to look at, too. If you're like me and are a three D learner. All right, is that everybody who's going to answer? I think so. Good, that is D, menisci. So the, there's a medial and lateral meniscus, the little cups that turn the round femur into the flat um, surface of the tibia. Oh, we're not going to do that one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what can go wrong in joints. Um, so, you know, we've all heard of arthritis. But um, this is actually going to show you, you know, what that is. So if we take a little camera and we put it into the joint capsule so we can see inside the joint, in the normal case, this is what we would see. You know, we would see shiny white, nice and smooth surfaces. These are the articular cartilages. You know, they're supposed to be like smooth, hard plastic. Um, uh, and, and that's so as the bones move in relation to one another, the articular cartilages reduce friction so that it's nice and slick and smooth as those bones move. Well, for uh, several different reasons, um, these cartilages can get broken down so that they're not slick and hard and smooth anymore, but instead starts to look like this, you know, where we have 
gaps, we have cracks, we have rough spots. So this is what you'd see in arthritis. Um, and what that word means is an arthros is a joint. So an arthritis is an inflammation of a joint. And in this case, what we're seeing is that inflammation is because the articular cartilages have been broken down. The problem is, once this process starts, it has a tendency to progress. Um, articular cartilages don't heal very well. And once they start to get a little rough, they start to tear, they start to tear themselves apart even more, you know, which sort of makes sense. This system would work great, but what if you took a little bit of sand, let's say, and you sprinkled it in here? Well, these cartilages are not going to stay smooth for very long because that sand is going to start to grind away at those smooth surfaces and start to break it down. And that's exactly what happens in arthritis. Once the articular cartilages start to break down, little pieces of it come off. We have a smooth spot rubbing against a rough spot, which is going to make the, the smooth part rough too. So it progresses until eventually there is no articular cartilage left. And all you have is rough bone on one side of the joint and rough bone on the other. And every time that joint moves, it's going to hurt because bone isn't really uh, evolved to move against bone. You know, that's why articular cartilages are there. So that's the point where you have to um, uh, do something about it, which I'm going to show you in a minute what we do. All right, so that's arthritis. We're going to come back to that. Um, in the knee, um, we talked about the cruciate ligaments. So, like you can see that here's the posterior cruciate, here's the anterior cruciate, and see that spot right there that's kind of reddish? That would be a tear or um, a damage to the anterior cruciate ligaments. Now, this one, uh, we probably wouldn't need to do anything about because everything is still attached. But you can imagine, you know, what if this anterior cruciate ligament was just kind of dangling here? Well, we actually would have to put it back in position or it would just dangle, you know, forever until it, it shrunk up and became a scar instead. Um, MRI is very commonly used to look at the knee because there's so much tissue there and there's all these complex 3D relationships. Um, it's a good tool for that. So like in this, we're look, this is the uh, end of the femur. So here's the medial and lateral condyles. You know, from the back, we can see the fibula here, here's the tibia, and then here's the back part of the um, uh, uh, femoral condyle, so the medial and lateral. All right. So that arthritis that we talked about, it, when the articular cartilages are destroyed, there isn't anything, there isn't much we can do. You know, we can't go, we don't know how yet to go in and put new articular cartilages in. If we did, that would be great, but we don't. But what we do know how to do is make stuff out of metal. And <laughs> we can make stuff, we can make structures that um, very closely or exactly um, model the relationship between the bones, and we can do those in metal. So um, there are a variety of different artificial joints that are available. Um, you know, here's a shoulder. So like this plate right here would uh, screw into the uh, scapula. And this part right here would be sort of bored into the top of the humerus um, to replace a damaged shoulder, as you might get from somebody who's had um, you know, uh, arthritis of the shoulder from repetitive activity. Uh, here's a knee, which we're going to see a video about a knee replacement here in a minute. But here's the tibial plate. So this part would get screwed into the top of the tibia. And then this part would get um, attached to the distal end of the femur. And then there's even a patellar component here, too, to continue to provide that protection of the patella for the open face of that joint. And then um, here would be an artificial hip. And this one, I think, is it's practically exact to the way our own anatomy is. You know, we, we have um, a ball and a socket, essentially. So this part would go into the coxal bone, into the acetabulum. And then this part would go into the femur and essentially replace that hip joint. So these two you see very commonly. You will encounter patients who have had knee replacements and hip replacements. And that's because those joints are very susceptible to osteoarthritis, which is the arthritis of wear and tear. 
You know, so if you are, you know, getting to be 50, 60, 70 years old, and you have used your joints, so to speak, you know, you've been active in your life, you've, um, uh, in work or in play, oftentimes the joints start to give out long before the person does. Um, so we can replace those joints with uh, titanium ones that will last a long, long time, yeah. Is it safe, though, to, if you're 60 or, my grandma actually, in a couple weeks ago, had a hip replacement, and she is 81. Uh -huh. I just don't understand, like, how that could be safe. safe if, Depends on the rest of the health of the patient. If she's got another 10 years in her, you know, yeah. then she might as well be up walking around. And while a hip replacement is a big deal, they're, you know, folks get back up and they're by six weeks, they're usually pretty mobile again. So it's okay. <laughs> oh, no, I was just wondering because I didn't think. Yeah. I mean, surgery is always dangerous. Um, and that's why they try to put it off as much as possible. But it's all about quality of life. You know, you don't, you don't want to say, oh, there's nothing we can do when there's something we can do. Yeah. Um, I... That um, old age old saying, if you pop your knuckles or if you pop things on your body, okay. are you getting rid of cartilage? No. No? Okay. No. Yes. <laughs> no. Pop a lot. That one is not true. Okay. All right. So this, this one's new. This is the new thing I added because I knew we were going to have some time. So this is a video of a total knee replacement. Well, it's supposed to be. Let's go to the surgery. Yeah. Hold on, it's not. Okay, hold on. I gotta find it on YouTube, I guess. Hold on. Now, is this a TKA? Yeah. <laughs> It would help if I could spell, right? It's this one. Content warning. You can sign in mine if you don't have a Gmail. Why do I have to sign in? Because it's got inappropriate. It's surgery. Did you it want to didn't use make me do that before. <laughs> Stuff. Oh man. Hold on. Yeah, do you want me to just put mine in? I might have you do that. I'm just going to try it in because it didn't do that to me before. <laughs> oh, come on. There's like lag. Knee. Re. There. Yeah, this is the one I wanted. Yeah, here, come in and sign, up, sign in. Oh, there. It's going to let me do that anyway. All right. Phew, finally, okay. Okay. The first thing I would mention is that we are meticulous about preventing infection. We do everything such as spacesuits, antibiotics, antibiotic irrigation, and even seal the skin with this plastic that we put on. Here we are making an incision with the tele in the center of your screen now. As we make meticulous adjustments so that we can get exposure, now we're seeing the end of the femur. We take One of the reasons I'm showing you this, I promise I won't keep interrupting, but <laughs> orthopedic surgery is like the most brutal surgery that you'll ever see. I mean, it is, it is very coarse. You're going to see saws. You're going to see drills. You, I mean, it is all, we call them the carpenters because... You know, their, their surgical toolbox looks more like something you'd build a house with than something that you, you know, spurs on cure side. And Of course, once that's done, we want to take the spurs off on the other side as well. So that's a there are also some spurs on the underside of the kneecap, the patella, which we also remove. This allows us to more adequately and accurately <laughs> size the different bones for the Drilling into implant. the femur, that's what he's We doing. make a hole, a tunnel in the center of the femur here, and then we slide a rod down. The inside of the femur, using this as a guide, this allows us to cut a specific angle relative to the femur, usually five or seven degrees. We can then cut.
cut very accurately 8 or 10 millimeters off the crystal femur. So that's the end of the theme. Yeah. That we have at. a capture device here that makes it a slot that we slip our saw blade into to make our cuts extremely accurate. Here we are taking a thin cut off the end of the thigh bone, end of the femur. Now this is typical. Most people think we're taking huge cuts of bone. That's just not the case. As you see here, we're taking very small, so thin just cuts of bone, the off. just enough to make the angles right and to make the prosthesis have enough room to fit with your knee aligned near perfectly. This is a jig that has four different slots and we cut in that jig once we set it up right. But here's an example of the posterior part of the femur. Look how much we're taking off. Not a whole lot. Just the right angle. This is another jig. For a certain type of prosthesis, we take out the center of the femur here so that a slightly larger prosthetic implant on the femoral side can fit. You will notice a lot of squirting water. This is antibiotic saline that's pumped in in a pulsatile lavage system. This really squirts, keeps all the soft tissue, bony tissue nice, clean, moist, further decreasing the risk of infection. We're going to remove this bone more? now and then we'll no. focus on the tibia. All right, so what they've done essentially is they the Here we have the tibial guide lining up longitudinally from the front and the side with the shin bone, the tibia. This guide goes from front to back and we're very meticulous about how we orient this. It's maybe the most important cut of the entire operation. We also match the slope of the top of the shin, the top of the tibia. And we are meticulously making sure everything's lined up nicely at the top of this guide. We're going to insert a device that allows us to take approximately two millimeters below the lowest point on the tibia if it's not too deficient. Now, once we adjust that down, notice we have a nice slot we're looking straight down. That's where the saw blade is going to go and take that cut right below the tip of that little guide. Looking straight down this slot. Now the saw is coming in with great view, showing you how we make this cut to take off just the right amount of tibia. Now, as we pry this up, you'll note it's very thin. You can even see the light through yes. the thinness of that bony cut. Took the as we remove it, you'll see we're really not removing a lot. Again, the myth of the huge bony cuts. We have a tibial trial that allows us to match the size of the tibia so that we know what size implant to use. On the femur, we have five cuts we've made plus that central cut. Now, we fit this on the end of the femur. And we're going to try to make sure we're nice and balanced. It needs to be lined up perfectly. Once we do this, we take the plastic insert between the femur and the tibia and insert this. This allows us to check the balance of the ligaments. Here's the insert right here. As we insert this, we then aggressively check and make sure it comes out straight without any difficulty, but not too loose. We bend and twist and torque your knee to make sure everything balances nicely. We then irrigate again, of course. This is something we do every three to five minutes throughout the case. Here is the patella. We, in this specific case, want to take about eight millimeters off of the bone. This is a device that allows us to be very accurate in doing so. So the shape of the back saw yet again. Take off exactly eight millimeters. Once this is done, as you will see, we've actually taken off a very thin piece of bone. We're again trying to take off what we are going to replace with prosthesis. Very thin cut. Once we size this and drill the peg holes, we bring in the prosthesis, the trial prosthesis with the peg holes, and we make sure that it tracks normally. We sometimes have to adjust the ligaments that balance that. Again, irrigating copiously, keeping those soft tissues and bony tissues moist. Now we instrument for the bottom of the tibial prosthesis. This is a keel of sort that fits into the tibial bone and further stabilizes the tibial base plate. We pound that in 
make sure it's just right. We size usually from a smaller size up to a larger size so we do not have a fracture. And once we've done that, this is what we've taken off on the left here on the femur. Small pieces of bone, very specific meticulous cuts. So femur we look at the tibia. This is what we've taken off and this is what we're going to replace it with. And then finally, of course, the patella uh, is the small green button and we take a small piece there. Notice it's pretty identical. Well, that's what we're after. We want to match it. Here's another step we often take many times throughout the case, but certainly before we put the actual implants in, we change gloves. This is another step toward antisepsis, prevention of infection. Here are the actual prosthetic implants, the femur, the tibia, and then of course the base plate fits on top of the tibial prosthesis. And then, of course, we have the patella. Notice the little pegs on the bottom that fit into those holes we've already prepared in the patella. We mix the cement with tobermycin. It's an antibiotic that most surgeons use to decrease the risk of infection even more. And this is mixed under vacuum to decrease the porosity. Notice how porous that bone is. We're going to squish the cement right in there and make it bond like crazy. In fact, it's very difficult once you cemented this in to get it out. Here we are putting cement on the bottom of the tibial base plate and we will get that just in the right place and then we'll put some glue on top of the tibia itself. Sometimes we call it glue, sometimes we call it cement, same thing. We push this down into that spongy bone to give us a much better bond. Once we do this, so that's the tibia we cement our tibial base plate in place. Notice that we squish the glue out because we have more than enough. We want too much, not too little. And so once this squishes out, we get rid of the excess cement by just trimming it off right here. After doing this, uh, we want, of course, a line-to-line -line fit, and we've already made sure that's the case. Some of them are screwed in. Is this one cemented? We put cement on the back of the femur, make sure it's in the right place, mold it just right. Then we put cement on the femur itself, push it in that spongy bone to make sure we get a great bond, and then we impact the femoral prosthesis in place, bonding it to the femoral bone, and notice the uh, cement swishing out again. We take the inserter off, remove excess cement at this point. After we remove the cement, of course we have to remove that central cement as well. We take the trial plastic between the femur and the tibia and insert that and then straighten the knee. This makes sure we can maintain full extension or a fully straight knee. That's imperative. Have to have that. Finally, of course, we put cement into the bone on the patella, place the patellar prosthesis in place. Those pegs fit both holes. We have a device to compress this and hold this while it hardens, made specifically for this purpose. We remove the extra cement and hold it till it's nice and hard. From the time we start mixing cement, that's about 15 minutes. This is the actual implant, the base plate poly. We tap it in place and it's firmly fitting. Then we aggressively check that knee, make sure it comes out straight, torque it, stress it, angular stress, rotational stresses. Once that's perfect, we know we can close. Here's the deep layer. We do the superficial layer. And then we go finally to the skin. Notice how those lines line up. This gives us a good guide to match skin to skin. That's how we put in the staples. Of course, they go all the way down. You'll note there's a little drain tube that does not allow blood to collect inside your knee. So that's a knee replacement in 10 minutes. Cool, huh? Have you done uh, at all right well that's it for today folks so um, next time we'll start in on uh, on muscle tissue and just as a warning this next chapter is heavy in physiology so please have read the chapter before Monday okay so you won't be or not have read it but Look through the, the diagrams, go through the chapter, otherwise you'll be lost the whole time. Okay.